uh, Mrs. Eva Jeřičná. And uh, it is my pleasure to say just a few little words. Uh, she has been studying at this uh, university, at the CTU in Prague, and then continued at the Academy of Fine Arts under Jaroslav Fragner. And in 1968, which is quite way back, she gained a temporary work placement in London. She was working as an architect with the Greater London Council on social housing projects. But, as you know, in August 1968, the Warsaw Pact invaded Czechoslovakia and her travel permit was annulled by the Czechoslovakian Ministry of Interior. She consequently decided to stay in the United, Nation, in the United Kingdom. Uh, she became renowned in the 1980s, especially for her retail and residential interior design projects, as well as totally unbelievable glass staircases. In 1982, she founded her studio Eva Jirichna Architects, and in 1999, co-founded AI Design together with Petra Wagner, who will be coming a little bit later to visit us. Her projects include Leicester Library, Orangery at the Prague Castle, several Joseph retail shops, Prague Hotel Joseph, the reconstruction of St. Anna Church, the convention center in her birth town, Zlin, and many, many others, not only in Britain, and the Czech Republic, but also in New York, Florence, Paris, Tokyo, and other cities. Eva has received 11 honorary doctorates, including the Czech Technical University doctorate, and several important honors. And I, I will read a few of them for you to understand how important our guest is today. She's a member of the Royal Academy of Arts, a royal designer for industry, an honorary member of the Royal Society of Arts. She was awarded the Jane Drew Prize, the State Award of the Czech Ministry of Culture, the Honorary Silver Medal of Jan Masaryk, the CBE, the Commander of the British Empire, which is the highest order of the British Empire for her services to interior design and the Lifetime Achievement Medal by the London Design Festival. This September, on San Wenceslas Day, she received the last award, the Silver Medal of the President of the Czech Senate. And Eva, uh, we are honored to have you here as a guest lecturer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just would like to start telling you how touched I am to see you all here because it's the situation when people don't actually have surface too often and um, I really cannot understand where all those years since I was sitting as you do, you know, and listening to other people's giving lectures pass so quickly. So, uh, but anyway, so I'm here just to encourage you and now. Every so often, you know, when I'm asked to give an interview, so people ask me the same question. Is it possible for a Czech student to succeed abroad? Is it possible to Czech architect um, uh, to become famous abroad? Well, uh, you know, I don't consider myself everything what you just have heard. I don't know, you know, how I deserve it. I have never done anything. I'm not an ambitious person. I'm ambitious in a sense that I want to get things done properly, but I am personally not a person who fight for anything. I don't approach any journalist. I don't seek any publicity. So everything what I got somehow, you know, was a piece of luck. And I think that every single one of, one of you has got a chance that the same piece of luck drops from God knows where you. And so, and since I uh, promised to start talking about what the situation was, when I was a student, I did not uh, find any projects uh, because I studied in Zikova just around the corner from you. So, uh, and I entered in the faculty in 1956. So I'm 
extremely old, as you can imagine. And <laughs> but no, I found the projects which I did at the, at the Academy of Fine Arts when I did my MA degree a little bit later on, and I studied with Jaroslav Fragner, who I think that somehow you know, made me really understand what architecture was all about. I also have to say, I was not a person who decided to study architecture as my life dream. You know, I wanted to study chemistry. And why I, did, I wanted to study chemistry? <clears throat> because I liked the process of discovering, liking. I really liked what is happening inside things. So I was destroying constantly my mom's kitchen by running experiments of uh, <clears throat> trying to um, I don't know, melt a piece of metal and see how it crystallizes. And uh, from stupid, the most stupid reason you can imagine, I just had an argument with my chemistry teacher before I passed the A-levels. And so I did the A-levels in physics. And of course, they said, well, you can't study chemistry if you have A-levels in physics. During the communism, it was not very easy to take a year out and, uh, and do um, another A-levels a little bit later. So I started you know, looking at the other options. And a friend of mine said, why don't you come with me to study architecture? So I mentioned it to people. And that time, that was now uh, talking in 1956, everybody said, for a woman, architecture, you are crazy. So um, my dear father, who I really loved very much, who was an architect himself, he said, you are going to get married, you marry an architect, and you will become an architect's wife, meaning that's the end of it. And that is why you see me here with uh, uh, more than 60 years of experience working as an architect, because I wanted to prove that it is possible for a woman to become an architect. Why I did it, I have no idea, but it was... Uh, despite, you know, it was not the decision that I would have loved the subject. I just have wanted to prove the, what I thought, everybody thought impossible. And uh, the first day I entered the building, I actually decided that it is something which I wanted to do for life. And I've been doing it to my late age. And yes, I am going to talk about the problems, but I have never said I'm sorry that I changed my mind. On the other hand, you know, in my next life, perhaps I'll do the chemistry because they are more <laughs> useful <laughs> for the future. I think that architects might be. Anyway, so that's a bad joke. And so if you look at the screen, I'm just not going to look at that because it's going to be easier. That is the quality of work which we used to express ourselves in. We only had, not even a rapidograph, that is one of those drawing pens which you had to fill in with ink, you know, and do all those little drawings. Uh -huh. I need one more a piece of equipment. And uh, that was the School of Architecture, um, which uh, I, uh, I worked on, and it was the school to replace um, the Academy of Fine Arts. This project was a student's competition, and it was selected to go to Paris, and I went with this project. Now, it was in 1965. In 1965, it was, we were completely isolated. We couldn't go to the library to borrow the books uh, which came from abroad. Since my father was allowed to travel from time to time during the exhibitions, so occasionally, you know, we got a magazine and we copied it on a piece of tracing paper because we wanted to see how the foreign architects actually worked. And so these are the examples of, you know, using just of the simplest method. But this project in Paris in 1965, not only that I was able to meet all the famous architects of that period of time, but uh, I, and I also won a few bobs for which I could buy the family a little presents. And that is another project which was a, which was a nursery school by... Uh, Manus Bridge, uh, and, um, and again, this little project, as you can see, I think that it was done with a great deal of attention 
to every single line on a piece of paper. It was, um, I thought about the children following the sun uh, during the winter and going against the sun uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, summer. Uh, and uh, with these drawings, I came to England. So you can see that it wasn't anything which was a great quality or a great caliber. But for a period of time, for England, I could actually make a perspective, I could draw, and every single job which I applied for, I was offered, because they didn't need architects, they wanted draftsmen. And so the starting point was that I could simply draw. So, and, and when I was working on some of the projects later on, so we had drawing boards, we had vanish, vanishing point, at, let's say five or six meters apart, and you had to run with a piece of uh, cotton, you know, from one end to another, drawing lines with all those T-squares. So, yes, it was fun, but uh, anyway, so, I, uh, I mean, slight correction, I um, joined the Society for Human Rights before I went to England, and after the invasion, uh, they decided that it was too dangerous for the regime to have members of this very uh, young society uh, um, to come back to Czech Republic because they might have been approached by the foreign individuals. So they abolished my passport. And, so, and I was still working in GLC because I had a permission uh, to stay in London for a year. But since they abolished my passport and abolished my, my permission to stay abroad, they made me stateless. I could not go back. I would have gone straight to the prison. Then I was sentenced to three years of imprisonment in my absence for having left the country illegally. I had no option but staying in England. And, and, uh, and GLC was running out of work, so I had to start looking for a job. And that job, which I show in a minute, uh, was a big office which was designing a big, um, 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 big uh, Brighton Marina project port in, La in London. So now I'm just going very quickly to take you through a few photographs just to, to put you in a picture what, in what England looked like. So you can imagine somebody coming from a country from behind the Iron Curtain who have never seen anything else except no, five days in Paris when I saw, the, uh, I don't know, buildings which Niemeyer was building, uh, uh, the radio station, uh, and everything which was presented during this Congress of Architects. And here it is, England, which has got two kind of streams. One of them, a great deal of influence of the generation which uh, started growing up after the war and which was full of dreams, full of independent thinking. It wasn't only architects, artists, uh, in, uh, and suddenly the traveling between America, England, and the rest of Europe was suddenly flourishing. And so what I'm looking at is there is a inf great influence in architecture, super studio, um, and they, some of the projects and that is a project which a very young bunch of people called Archigram started producing, looking at everything what was the old-fashioned, traditional London scene, English scene, all the traditional houses, and breaking up all the rules, building up the buildings, walking city by Ron Heron. The type of presentation when everything was possible, everything was funny, full of joy, parties, Beatles, uh, Twiggy. But there was also very serious thinking, like thinking of Edward Bono about Lutcher thinking. And uh, so on those two levels, suddenly it just completely opened up a new look at what life was all about, what one wanted to do, who one wanted to work for, and who could you learn from. On the other hand, you know, there was this exciting project imagining what the future might look like. And uh, the organization GLC, which was Great London Council, 2,000 architects working for and being paid by state, built uh, the biggest housing scheme <coughs> called Thames Mead. This is what it looked like exactly in 1968 with these uh, little boys playing by the River Thames. And this is what it looks like now the catastrophic uh, um, misconception of what 
people would be able to manage people who suddenly started losing the employment with the crisis which followed this very short period after the war and suddenly those houses were being abandoned and this is what they look like now. And just as a matter of interest, that is the project to replace it. You know, is it any better? Is it going to have a better future? Nisa, the only difference is that those flats, they were council flats, and those people after the war, when everything was, London was completely destroyed by, by the war, they were housed and they were living in council housing. This is all private development, and it is so over-designed, dense, no private places. I just have seen that is a reality of our present life. That is another famous building by Erno Goldfinger. Again, uh, I, uh, um, I met Erno Goldfinger in Prague in, in 1967 at the Congress of Architects. And he was, in 1968, he was building this building, which again, you can see the roots from the pre-war architecture, modernist architecture. Yeah, and uh, he, so he took me uh, up this um, little staircase a tower, and he himself lived there for a while. Another big scheme, again, um, Barbican, which was a mixture of um, housing, culture, exhibition space. And one of the famous architects of the period, James Sterling, built this first glass building when he really had in mind to copy the dream of Miss van der Rohe, who designed the glass tower, which of course was before its time. And the building leaked all over the place, so architecture decided, you know, really got a very bad name. So in this terribly exciting period, I started looking for a job, and I was given a job to design uh, this um, uh, Brighton Marina. Brighton is a city um, on the south, uh, um, in south of England, with a famous pier. And the intention was to build 1,400 flats, um, about, accommodate about 300 and 500 boats, and do the exhibition center. Um, the partner of the firm I worked for, I got excited because, of course, there is no sea in this republic, so I thought it, was, it would be fun to learn something about the sea. So, and we were two people, one American guy and myself, and we were supposed just of to do this project. So you know, I was absolutely nobody being paid as miserably as you can imagine, person who came from an unknown country. Just to tell you, to put you in a picture what people looked at us, you know, I was taken by some of my friends to a little cottage outside London to see a lady who lived in a 14th century English cottage with beautiful garden. And we, you know, he was called Mr. Bentley. He drove Bentley car. His wife was Swiss, and she, I don't I remember, she started preparing English Christmas in July to make, uh, make it ready. What could have been more traditional? And these people took me to visit their friend. She was standing outside the house when we arrived, and when I got out of the car, she looked at me from the bottom up and from the top down, and then she turned towards my friends and she said, but she looks like us, <laughs> meaning I didn't have horns or tail and the hooves. So anyway, so this guy who was the partner of the firm was a son of an admiral. He was a soldier, brave soldier during the war, and when I, the first day when I came to the office, he said, no, we have to design a harbor, and no, um, I need you to make a vision of it. So I <laughs> needed three drawing boards with those vanishing points, and I had to draw a perspective of all the boats. Well, I can't imagine what it looked like. Unfortunately, I didn't save the picture. But no, nobody in that office could actually do it. We were just of this school, the Czech system, this pre-war modernist <laughs> architects who were our teachers as the taught us how to draw, and that is what was required. So on a basis of being able to do this perspective, he said, now you carry on and do the harbor. Well, it was a learning school, uh, which I can never 
ever uh, imagine how I was able even to, uh, to tackle, you know, it, uh, it was just of such an unexpected situation that the American guy who was writing about architecture, who, who wrote a book on serendipity, so he was not at all interested in drawing. So I was working with the best experts, you know, so, and the, and the engineers for this project were, were O. Verabs. O. Verab himself used to come to site meeting. And uh, from some reason, I have absolutely no idea how I managed to do it, but nice. If and that is how colorful the word was, so of course you have got oops, uh, you you have got all the boats. These were floating platforms, and this is the cliff. And somehow everybody wanted to put the buildings at the bottom, at the foot of the cliff, and so I somehow persuaded everybody to, because I said the cliff really wants to have the beach or the water in front of it. So we built this artificial piece of land which we call the spine. And I spent almost 10 years working on the project. And now, and the project started building up like that. So we made the trip, suddenly I started traveling all over the world, finding the crane, which would, which would be able to deliver the caissons into the sea, building the boatyards. You can imagine, that was the site which I never ever thought I would ever be able to go to. And I had to go twice a week to site meetings. You know, these were the caissons which were size of three-story building. And of course, in my naivety, when I started working, so I just started being interested in the quality of concrete. So the main contractor, I was just of describing how the shuttering should be done. Of course, then you drop these things into the sea and they are covered immediately with the seaweed and attacked by the storms and so on. But it was one of the most exciting uh, days, and uh, that is how the breakwater was being built. And I do remember when I first came to the site meeting, just to, to tell you what is likely to happen to you at one point in life as well. I, there was this big hut, and inside there were 60 people. They were all the contractors speaking every single dialect and every single and uh, language you can possibly imagine, including Cockney, Scottish, Irish, uh, uh, Welsh, whatever you, you can imagine. I opened the door and I was supposed to run that meeting. I had never, ever run anything like that before. So I closed the door, my heart started beating, so I, um, and I opened the door, closed the door, stood outside, and I thought, now I have to go back to London, I can't do it, I just don't have to resign. Then I saw my passport, because I only had a travel document, I, I was stateless. So I thought, no, my visa, you know, they are going to send me back, <laughs> they are going to send me to prison. So I opened the door again, and saw that there was a seat with my name, badly spelled, of course, and, uh, and there was a man sitting next to me, I had no idea who he was, uh, and so I said to him, I have no idea how to do it, you have to help me. And he was a managing director of the contractor. <laughs> and so he, he started telling me, now you do this, then you do that. And I, like a parrot, you know, and, and because I could not make notes and I could not, you know, listen to people at the same time. So I developed my memory up to the point that even now, you know, at my really late age, I can, after the meeting for two or three days, I can remember everything because I had to take everything back and write the minutes in the office because I, and of course my English was limited. I had to use the vocabulary, so now it is vice versa. Now I have to use the vocabulary when I'm going to give a lecture in Czech, which is really embarrassing to say. Uh, and now, this guy, when I told him how important it is to me to have the good quality of these caissons, so he took me to another uh, seaside in Brighton and he showed me what happens, you know, so when the concrete disappears and when all the seashells and the seaweed and all the other 
um, uh, little creatures, you know, really replace the good quality and sign of the texture in the shattering, which was very fashionable in, in those days. And these are just of very quickly the projects we wanted the building to look like, the uh, transatlantic steamers. So we were playing with this type of architecture that it would really be a seaside resort. Eventually, Brighton Marina Company, who started the project, ran out of money and the project was abandoned in this stage. So yes, they were floating platforms, they were viaducts, and there was land reclamation, boatyard, but the project was never finished. And just to put you in a picture what happened to this project, as soon as uh, we finished, so Wimpy Homes, which is the worst uh, developer in building the ugliest and the most dreadful housing, took over, filled up the era between, no, sorry, between the cliff and, no, and the sea, built up low-level houses and went bankrupt, abandoned the project. Another company went back, replaced the housing with slightly tall buildings, six-story At the moment, they are digging back this logged basin, I mean, the area of water meeting the cliff because nobody can live at the bottom of the cliff because of uh, uh, the eddies which the wind produces, you know, so when the, the weather becomes really, really unpleasant. And so nobody can actually live because the wind comes against the cliff, starts turning, and then sending everything up, you know, so now I think, and they are, I was there two years ago, just before the COVID started, and no, I don't know, I can't say to my pleasure, but now yeah, I'm going to the original concept from 1969. So that's about, that's about Bright Marina. So Bright Marina project comes to the end. And then in spite of the fact that I was really miserable paid, but I was an associate of this very big firm, so I started looking for a job and nobody was going to give me a job because everybody saw that I was going to be too expensive. And suddenly I met a little retailer called Joseph who came from Morocco, who wanted to be uh, an architect, but he didn't even have A-levels. So he decided that he was going to start cutting people's hair and he became a hairdresser. And now, you know, everybody in my family was called Joseph. My grandfather's were Joseph, my father was Joseph, my brother is Joseph, and this guy was also called Joseph, Joseph is a BH. And now, he um, had a shop which was, um, he used to go um, to Cafe Picasso, and he used to ask, who is the best architect in London? So when he made a little bit of money, so, and somebody said Norma Foster. So he went to Norma Foster. Norma Foster saw that he wasn't really worth talking to, but nevertheless, he appointed Jan Kapritsky and another no, architect who was Swiss. So two people, again, two foreigners, were asked to design the shop for Joseph. And they did a fantastic looking shop, but unfortunately, it didn't work from the retail point of view. And during the opening party, I was talking to a woman, and she said, what do you do for a living? I had no job, so I said, oh, I'm looking for a job, I'm an architect. And she said, oh, we need an architect. You know, we need help with our apartment. So, after this huge project, when we invested 145 million into changing a piece of water into living accommodation, so suddenly, I found out that this woman was the wife of Joseph, and the project was that they had two sons and two bedrooms, and I was asked to, do, to move the partition between two bedrooms, so because one of them was small, one of them was big, and the boys were fighting. Of course, I had absolutely no idea how to do it, you know, so I didn't know about small builders. I could do the drawings, but that was about, about it. And then, of course, it was the period of very colorful architecture, everything in plastic was just of uh, the flavor of the time. So I started putting colorful bedspreads on the boys' bedroom, and, and the wife of Joseph, who is called Edna, but she renamed herself Coco after Coco Chanel because it was fashionable. 
So when she saw, because I put a red door handle off one of the doors, and she saw it was so ugly that she burst into tears. And uh, that was the end of that. But Joseph, you know, loved the red door handles and loved the scheme. So, and shortly after, they separated. So, <laughs> I don't know whether it was due to the door handle, um, I take full responsibility. But then Joseph said to me, Eva, you have to find me a flat. Because <laughs> so I found a little space. Uh, again, you know, all my experience was from Brighton Marina using GRP and, and glass reinforced plastic. And so I put together this apartment, which sliding doors, everything was overscale. Now, I would like to say something about high tech. Because this generation of uh, my contemporaries that time, again, you know, being uh, brought up or being born immediately after the war, just of could see the progress in technology. So suddenly, this kind of um, lateral thinking that different uh, uh, um, um, interest, uh, you know, or different um, uh, imagination and uh, and inspiration could be drawn from industrial products, started bringing it into the building industry. And this is how high tech basically happened. The high tech was not only that architects would be imagining how they do big doors and big structures when you go to Vienna, Cobb, Himmelbau, or whichever. Uh, all those architects of the same period of time who really I was growing up with. So they were just of really trying to find an architecture style, but they were supported by the structure engineers. And this is what happened in England. This collaboration of structure engineers and architects became extremely, extremely well advanced and important. The architects and structure engineers worked together from day one at the projects. The structure engineers were bringing up the ideas how to make things and how to calculate things. Now, I, what I wanted to say about Brighton Marina, the main architect of O. Verab, who was a famous man, his, his firm still exists and has got offices all over the world and resolving the most complex uh, building projects. Uh, he was saying to me in Brighton Marina, he said, you have to save materials because we run out of materials, but we will have too many people unemployed. So we have to give people an opportunity to earn their money by using manpower. So don't you know, do things simple. Employ as many people as you can, but save the materials. You know, somebody saying it in 1968, when you look at where we are now, that was just of something which was absolutely remarkable. And now, so, and, this, I think, at talking about this high tech, so you can see sliding doors. This flat was published in every single magazine. Not that I would have asked anybody. It was just because that time it looked so different to anything else. So people just started looking at it on photographs, mirrors, and the interior just of using the simple ceramic tiles on the floor. I can't show you the bed and, 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 and any details. And it was also the time of architecture, so-called ideas competition. So all these ideas, you know, which which you went and see. So we all copied you know, the way how Super Studio, of course, you know, I could never do it as well as they did. But these were all the projects and what could happen in Battersea Park, all these images of uh, and, uh, people flying to the moon, which actually happened before they managed to get to the moon. Competitions when, you know, when um, airships would deliver people uh, to Trafalgar Square to experience uh, image of London museums, you know, it was just of really having fun, apart from being employed, <laughs> doing competitions. And of course, as you can see, I was always obsessed with detailing. So that was a competition to use something which was an invented foam rubber. And, uh, and I just of managed to do the entire interior with the walls, uh, ceiling, seating, 
and then having won the competition, so they made a prototype of one of those wall panels. Not that it would have meant anything, another competition, which was a landmark for Melbourne, when you had an inflated, helium-inflated ring fly, floating above the town, and people on little cable cars, you know, going around and looking down the city. In the meantime, parallel to that, uh, I started doing little shops for Joseph, so the scale completely changed from this huge project, you know, with Wellington's letters being covered with mud and dealing with those guys, you know, who really mm, knew how to mm, do the sheet piling, how to pour concrete into the sea. So suddenly you start le dealing with the retailers who are terribly fussy about every single detail. And this is, I mean, um, going back to simplicity and to almost minimal way of using, uh, of doing the design uh, as a background to what those retailers, because the fashion was also a part of that period. The fashion was just a, kind of uh, in a very embryonic stage. So Joseph, came, having come from Morocco, he started buying stuff in Paris, which, which was unheard of. There was Yves Saint Laurent and a few big designers, but ready to, ready to wear clothes. It, it was just of Joseph who started suddenly growing an empire and changing London by working on those shops. So you can see that everything is suspended on cables because suddenly in Brighton, you know, I discovered the technology of tension cables and this um, over of being the engineers. So that is the shop and you can just see uh, hanging, uh, a little bit of steel and a little bit of glass. And next funny story, uh, another shop for Joseph was for a concession for Kenzo. Kenzo being a Japanese designer, he wanted wood. I had never touched wood in my life. I had no idea how to do the wood. So I had to ask all those carpenters to help me. And, and of course, that time the shops were extremely cheap. It's not like what you see now in Paris, when people spend millions you know, investing into a flagship store. These shops were just of simplicity, and it was really using the space and, and playing with um, and the forming of uh, the environment which would really bring people in, but which would left, leave the fashion to, um, uh, to bring or to play the main role. And now, Richard Rogers and Norma Foster were walking, walking down Sloan Street when this shop was finished. I was still in the shop doing the snagging list, and they said, who designed it? Richard said, but who designed it? And I said, I, it was my job, because I was on my own, because I could still not find any job. Richard said, you have to come and work on Lloyd's building, which of course did not exist. So I became one of the group leaders on this building because I was an expert on wood. <laughs> So suddenly, because Lloyd's, as a very traditional English company, who came from um, uh, from Lyons House, which was little timber cafeteria, you know, so so they wanted the inside of this uh, building, which won the competition, to be in wood because they saw that it was the war material which was going to give them the comfort and pleasure of sitting in nature when they were doing you know, their work. So I spent two and a half years working on the inside of this building. And of course, you can see that now it was, of course, initially I was supposed to do the interiors, but as a team with six people, so we did, we did everything. We did floors and ceilings and part of the roof. It was just of another architecture job. So again, so after Brighton, so it was such a brilliant school, again, working. In, I mean, the main engineer on this job was somebody called Peter Rice, who was a genius. He was the one who solved the problem of the Sydney Opera House when nobody else could win. He was initially working for overups and then he became, um, and then he started on his own. And so again, we, we worked on every single detail and everything suddenly 
you know, was calculated up to the point that you could live with the amount of steel you can, and if you put steel in tension, of course, you know, so you can use very small profiles if you put it in compression, so you have to use much more material. Uh, using suddenly, you know, playing with the glass, which was again in a very embryonic form, you could not do much with glass except using the plain glass in different thicknesses. You couldn't hardly bend it. You couldn't make it safe. You could toughen it, but it was expensive. And of course, toughened glass is not really safe. And so there were a few other jobs, you know, again done for Joseph. And he suddenly started growing his uh, empire. So that was meant to look like an Italian palazzo for two pounds fifty, you know. So, uh, so everything is just of done in plaster, which was sealed with uh, linseed oil because we didn't have any money uh, to do any, any better finish, not even to paint it. And at that point, um, you know, the retail suddenly started fighting for the space because <clears throat> the retail started growing up. So um, suddenly, you know, people started using the basement as a selling space. And of course, basement has got no light and people did not want to go down to the basement because they didn't feel comfortable. And so Joseph said, you have to make me this basement comfortable. We spoke with a very strong French accent. And, uh, and so I just thought if we make a glass staircase, it would bring the daylight in it. But of course, nobody knew how to do it because there was no way how the building regulations allow you to use glass as a safe material. So I um, had an idea, and again, we worked with a very bright structure engineer, that if you put a sheet of plexiglass underneath the glass, if the glass breaks, it would hold the glass in a position. And then, of course, the interpretation, instead of having a stringer, you don't need to have a stringer. You can just interpret the stringer by doing this little... Uh, sorry, beam, when you have every single note, you know, that is the thread, and that is the little, uh, little truss supporting the staircase. Um, this was the first staircase which we did. Uh, the building inspector himself signed the drawings because nobody else could and nobody else knew you know, how to give us a permission to use it uh, and to, uh, to um, agree or to prove that the building is safe and that it's not dangerous. And then, of course, people who made it just did not make a proper indentation on those diagonal rods which hold the staircase. So when they still working in the shop, so it all slide and started sliding down. And suddenly the day before the opening, the staircase just made a nice little curve and bent. So I was called by the builder to come to the shop 10 o'clock in the evening. People who made the staircase were in Bristol, which is like, I don't know, being in Bratislava. Uh, not, not quite, maybe, but no. And no. So they had to come with a little car, turn the staircase into little components, take it back into the workshop, improve all those little semi-holes, and bring it back. So Joseph comes to the shop on Sunday morning, just before the opening on Monday, and there's no staircase. So he called me in an absolute fury, and I said, well, you know, the staircase got dirty, so we had to send it to the cleaners for cleaning. And by 11 o'clock, it was back. So, you know, architects, um, you know, I had a sleepless night as well. I had no idea whether it was going to work or not. But no, somehow, you sometimes have to do a little lie. These are just of a few models, you know, what to do with the buildings, like this is a bank, banking hall, which the client wanted to divide into two, um, two level space. So we put those hanging platforms into the dealer's desk, and that is a photograph of the model in 1 to 50. Comes another Joseph's shop, yet another staircase, uh, this time it is much bigger, so again, you know, every single component has been calculated. It's just on that we set ourselves a limit that there would be no cable bigger than six millimeters in diameter. So then it became a little bit too fussy. 
and the staircase is now in Copenhagen. Uh, another staircase in Paris, which was at the exhibition, and it comes to another um, job. And why I'm showing you so many staircases? Because the frustration when I started doing these interiors that I had absolutely no way to, um, to do anything which was working with all those structure engineers, with all those bright people who actually knew how to do a little bit of uh, technical research and, and you know, interpret the materials, play with metal, play with glass, and find a way how you can do the impossible. So that was all done for people. I mean, when we did this staircase, so it started off just off as a simple truss when the threads are hanging from this beam. And that is what holds the staircase. And the client who said to me that he hated metal, he hated glass, and he hated all those what he called modern materials, and who was collecting 18th century China. So he just had the staircase, which was glass and metal, and no, the kitchen, which was uh, in stainless steel. I'm showing these two pictures to see, you know, it was three floors in a very traditional Georgian building how you have to work with light and how the light changes the interior. That is early in the morning and that is late in the afternoon. That quality of spaces when you work with light, which is one of the most amazing and interesting thing which you do, you know, when you do interiors and you can actually transfer it to the buildings later when you learn how to do it. So and that is a company, we did about, I don't know, 70 shops for the American company all over the world. And they were very keen on working with wood again, not repeating it. Wood doesn't talk to me very nicely, so I don't talk to wood nicely. I, I can't really. They are, as uh, Adolf Luce would say, if all the materials are equal, so I think that glass and metal are a little bit more equal than the others, but anyway. Um, and there is you know, yet another interpretation of uh, what you can do with glass, nightclubs, yet another part of playing. And the Overa guy uh, built himself the house, which is um, the one which you can see on your left-hand side. And now he died and his family did not like the house, so they sold it in the auction. It was bought by a very rich American, no, not American, the South African guy, and he wanted to pull the house down. Well, I could never pull the house down because it was such a good friend and such a magnificent uh, guy. So we persuaded him to build an extension. And again, we tried to limit because he preached to save the material. So we tried to do whatever he preached all his lifetime and keep as many. He was from Scandinavia, so we tried to keep as many features. but the guy who bought it, uh, so that is his bedroom on the upper floor, and he was only interested that the television set would come up so he could watch from bed his uh, football matches. And uh, just a few details. Another job when we again tried to experiment. I think that was the first structure which we did, which was purely made in glass. And, and there is absolutely nothing else except glass. Next time, that is the inside of the flat. Again, it was difficult because still we could not laminate the glass and we couldn't do tough and laminate it. So everything is still done on the principle of uh, the holding perspex. That is the little bridge connecting two parts of the building. He could live in a stainless steel coffin, if because he loved stainless steel, as not very many people do. And now, yet another crazy competition, which uh, I did, uh, you know, when we did all those crazy competitions at the nights and so on, it was just of playing with cutting people from the magazines. They were no computers, you know, drawings did not really give you the same impression. And that was the first thing when I just started thinking about making round display cabinets which would be turning and when you turn the light on so you would see the inside and you would see the glass floor, the glass ceiling. And then the same space was for real given to us as a job 
it was, uh, I don't know, but it is not a very good photograph. It's not very sharp, but it was, we could not at this point still do the curve glass. It was still not possible uh, because we could do the curve glass, but not laminated, not safe. And because not now you are putting ob objects in it, which are one million pounds worth each. So now, so we had to do the crystals instead of, instead of that. But now, of course, if you want to sell a watch for a million pounds, so you have to do lots of other things. So you have to entertain people. And now, and so it was still this learning curve, you know, how to use the materials, learning to see what, how you use the light, because the light is changing. I mean, all these jobs, which I've just shown you up to this point, there was no um, um, lighting except, and I think at the last job, low voltage lighting came to practice, you know, so before that, they were just of ordinary um, Edison's bulbs. And comes year 1989, and now I uh, came to Prague for the first time in 1990. I said I didn't really want to do anything in Prague because all my colleagues who had no opportunity to do anything all this period of time, so they just, I really didn't think that we were going to steal the work from them. And the first job which we did, which I'm not showing you, was the building for Andersen's Consulting because it was a competition and there were no Czech architects invited. So I just thought that maybe that we could have a go. We won that competition and we did the inside of the building. And I found out it was in 1992 that all the skill which I do remember in, existed you know, in 1950s, um, oh, 60s, suddenly disappeared. Everything was a problem. Glass doors, you can't do the glass doors. You know. Can you do the um, plasterboard straight? No, it, it can't be done. Nothing was possible. You know, there was just a, and the communism just of really managed to. Um, uh, completely destroy the people's skill. So, uh, as the golden check hands, as uh, uh, it used to be um, quoted very often, suddenly uh, there was unwillingness, you know, nobody really wanted to do anything. So, on Anderson's Consulting, I just had to bring in lots of people from England or from abroad. And at the same time, we were asked to do um, to replace the orangery at Prague's castle, uh, which was a job to do for Václav Havel. Well, I knew Václav Havel from before 1968, uh, and nothing seemed to be more exciting than doing the orangery at Prague's castle. We did a project again. We worked uh, from London office, so we worked uh, with uh, the British engineer. Uh, and the project was done and uh, designed uh, up to um, detail, NISA on the left hand side, there are photographs of the prototype of the structure because the, uh, the condition or uh, the brief ask for the buildings to be fully demountable. And then uh, we had 24 documents sent out to tender and not a single Czech firm could actually do it because that the skill wasn't here. Nobody was able to work on the com complexity of the structure. So I called a firm called Zell from Germany, who I worked with in Kuala Lumpur on a project with. And they bought this desolated factory in Pilsen and they started building it. The people who they used as their main designers were people from Skoda cars. So they are all uh, the construction guys who used to design the Skoda cars. The drawings were more perfect than I can tell you. Brilliant. But they just didn't know how to build. And because they did motor cars before and, uh, and mother firm from Stuttgart just of, did not give them sufficient support. So we built the structure and it was moving from left to right, from right to left. So here is our structure engineer sitting and holding his head, my colleague looking as if he lost his fortune. I'm also holding my hand and we are testing 
in the building next door, this node which holds the structure together. And as you can see, everybody is uh, extremely uh, uh, depressed because it did not work. Well, what happened? Something very funny. When I came to England in 1968, England was changing from metric, uh, from uh, um, imperial to metric. So instead of inches, they started using meters, centimeters, millimeters. So the firm bought the screws or the bolts in England, but they bought the drill to make the whole four recess, the heads of those bolts in Germany. So Germany was properly metric, England was not properly metric. So those two cones did not fit in each other. So therefore, the structure could not, I mean, the nodes could not be tightened up properly. They didn't fit. And now, so we had to re-drill 500 holes. How did I find out? Brought a guy from England who came, looked at it, and he said, you haven't got attention in those notes. We send it to... Um, one of the institute, you know, to do the proper detail measuring, and this is how we found out <laughs> that production did not actually fit, so we had to buy British uh, drill and drill the use, that is the rest of the project. Few projects, I'm only going to skip through it again, working with glass, doing all kinds of... And we are back again in Prague, Wojcielska, and here is another job to do the loft, you know, to get a permit. And now it starts with the check problem of getting a planning approval. So that was the loft from, yes, 16 something. And now they said, no, you cannot touch the timber, you cannot put any uh, windows in the roof. And, uh, and there was no access. So again, we did one of these little staircases hanging from the space. Eventually, we had to call it a nightclub because the nightclub does not deal daylight, but there is, as you can see in the photograph, huge amount of daylight. It doesn't need any more. And we open it. Yet another structure, that one was for Václav Havel, a conversion of um, sun and sheds, the most beautiful loft which you can look at, you know, made with small pieces of uh, timber interwoven into St. Andrew's crosses, which is very beautiful. Uh, and now, so we saw that we would just have liked, because uh, the structure was being used as a storage of, first of all, they printed the books uh, in the space when, uh, when the vaulting collapsed. And now we saw that now because we decided not to do uh, the reconstruction, so we made a very beautiful model of what it looked like because the space was divided into, uh, into five floors. So, uh, and, uh, so we just have thought we would make like little lines in the space, indication that there was the vaulting before, and we would just have leave it as a ruin. That is when the work started. And I think that I just mentioned two stories. When it was in this kind of stage, uh, Václav Havel decided to invite Prince Charles to come to help him to do the fundraising because he needed a little bit more money. Uh, and Prince Charles came. He was taken up um, uh, the builder's cage lift. He looked at it, and there are little Baroque decorations because it went through so many different conversions. That in the late Baroque, so they were those little angels holding um, the bedstones for the, for the vaulting. And Prince Charles said, what is that? So I said, well, they are little Baroque angels. Prince Charles looked really annoyed. And he said, and I'm quote, he said, get rid of it. We have got enough of Baroque architecture in Prague. So, you know, he is so obsessed with his limits and the way how he looks at his type of architecture that he could not even on a historic building accept that different country could do something else. So then we left it as a ruin and that is the space, you know, we put the heating in, we dried the walls, and we repaired some of uh, the murals and you now and just before the opening, when we had it, 
I don't know, maybe four or five times we had the planning approval turned down because they wanted to divide the loft from the nave. They wanted to put a glass ceiling. And eventually when it was all done, I don't bore you with the details, so one of the planning officers walked in. The building is 16 meters tall. We lifted the floor for 16 centimeters in order to put the heating in. And she said, you completely ruined the buildings because you completely changed the proportions. So <laughs> you can't really win, but no, that is, you know, you can see how the history walked through. You can see so many beautiful details. And that was the first opening. And Havel giving his um, prize to one of the scientists. Back to London project of... Um, a bus station above the Jubilee line. Now we are just approaching the millennium. Again, doing the structure which has got big wings because there, was, there is a tube underneath so we couldn't do any foundation of the any supporting structure except for four columns. So it looks like a bed with um, the reflective ceiling and now now the glass little thing is the actual beam which holds the roof together. That's what it is. And again, jump back uh, to 19, mid 90s. And uh, I started teaching at that point at Na Umprum. And Na, uh, the owner of the site, which is now Hotel Joseph, um, asked me whether we would help him to get a planning approval. Uh, for this building. Well, the building had a um, approval for three-story building, which would, which would um, marry uh, this late baroque building on the opposite side of the road. So, and we somehow managed to get an approval uh, to finish the police station, which is this 19th century heavily decorated building, and now put another texture of this hotel behind it. Um, we were trying not to use any of those reflective glass, so we just tried to get rid of the excessive sunshine and protect the inside of the building by no shades. And this is what it originally looked like, um, with uh, the rooms, minimal room size, but with the glass bathrooms. Now, of course, uh, after a few years, we had to change it into small complicated uh, structure and now I think that the client is doing another change with, with an Austrian architect. And that is another conversion project in London. This is the building which was built during uh, the Mozart times, uh, which was bombed during the war and we had a chance to change it, but we had to reconstruct part of it to the original state in order to be able to roof over the central space and now there is a little swimming pool before you, and you walk over the moving bridge if you want to go to the garden. We did lots of projects which were kind of speculative uh, developers' projects that we furnished, and we re redesigned uh, the shell of uh, the penthouses in a building. This one is near the river. Uh, two-story apartments when we again try to experiment with glass up to the point that we made the glass bars. And now another joke, you know, this round bed turns when you press the button so you can either watch the sunset or the sunrise. Um, ten years of the work on the museum, this is Victoria and Albert Museum, um, changing uh, the entrance doors into revolving doors, coming to the reception, which functions as a bar in the evening. Shop has been changed recently, uh, which used to be a gallery, a gallery of large sculptures, a small sculptures. I go back because in the, these shelves, glass shelves, in these huge cabinets, you know, are actually supported of the glass ceiling. Glass is extremely strong material, and every day, you know, you can just make it a little bit better, a little bit more efficient. 
um, and now and you know, it really, I think it still has got a great deal of future. Jewelry gallery. I never thought that you would be able to build these display cabinets, which we make a little model of. And now, um, a German firm just uh, took it as a challenge. And if you work with all those people, you know, so, and if you share the dirty mug of coffee or tea with them, which had never been washed, and when you get a confidence that you are actually not working against them, but working with them, so they can do extraordinary things. I never believed that it would be possible, but there is no, uh, no metal frame supporting it. It's glass being the structure element and the staircase. Again, the staircase is just of, there is a little beak. And that is what holds the threads. You know, this tiny little piece just of holds the entire thread. You know, so every single staircase which we do, so as fun, you know, we just have tried to use another different principle, different distribution of uh, forces, different uh, uh, distribution of what is in tension, what is in compression, and how the material, using the flexibility. So no, that is something which, because architecture, you know, is all about building. Yes, you can do all those iconic buildings, but they have to be built eventually. And if the architect and all the technical team work together, it is much better result. These are just of how many models, you know, and the presentations we do before we do a house, which is in Prague, um, still not occupied. Again, there is a little bridge leading to the garden. I don't know, I'm just terrified that I'm very late running out of time. What is but yes, so I think that I'm going to speed up very quickly. Um, so that is what the inside is um, and going to look like. As I'm saying, it's not um, still occupied, so we only do the photographs showing uh, the house empty as it is now. Um, now the jewelry shop in London this is what Harrods used to be like, having a jewelry department, and that's what it looks like now. And here we are in Slin. Have I ever thought that I would be able to go back to the town where I was born and which I left when I was four years old, and that we would have a chance to work uh, on this magnificent example of... Uh, and modern thinking, I'm not saying only modern architecture, but the concept, I won't bore you with the concept of, but as the concept of dividing the factories from living and all those little houses in one of which I was born, they were built as temporary dwellings because Bata used to say that he has to teach the cobblers to, uh, to live in the houses with a bathroom. Um, and before, when they came from the little villages and in 10 years time he wanted to rebuild it in a proper city. He was of course interested in aeroplanes, tires, he uh, introduced the trolley buses in order to reduce the pollution in his new town, unbelievable. He used the transportation with the canals. I mean that guy was really beyond his time. And I consider this particular building, which has been, to my mind, not terribly well reconstructed very recently, as one of the finest examples of the modern architecture, which was um, uh, the memorial of Batya where he died. And he surrounded himself, as you can see, the famous names. So Corbusier was asked to come to help him to redesign the town and he proposed four blocks of flats running across the valley. So, but I told him what I quoted before, I have to teach the cobblers how to live in the town before I go to your plan, but I call you back. Of course, it didn't happen because he killed himself. You know. 
aircraft accident. And now because Bata was very keen on education, every single employee had to do the further education attending the evening courses. So there were lots of schools, and now these which you can see in the front collapsed um, in not about 20 years ago. So we were asked to replace it with um, uh, the university library and the Philharmonic Orchestra building. Um, that is a uh, few visual images because we had to use this um, oval shape, which is the best possible shape for acoustically for any music building, but now because of the limitations of the site, we could not actually do a shoebox, which would, be, which would have been an ideal. And we didn't even have money to do a proper facade, so we just have used the glass bricks to produce the third layer of acoustic protection. And behind this translucent wall, there are offices and, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, whatever is apart from, um, from the foyer and from um, the auditorium for about 1,000 people uh, needed. It is very difficult to think about uh, and how to put the roof over an oval shape. And so what I forgot to say, that in those 60s, when I came to England, suddenly the structure engineers started talking about learning from the nature and bringing up and, you know, the way how the nature is constructed into architecture. And so this one is another example how this shape of this um, a little creature with those two main beams running across and the little ribs supporting it was really an inspiration for the roof. I mean, when you come to sight in what conditions people work, has to work, you know, it is absolutely amazing. When the welding was being done, so it was really mist and frost and snow and how strong the nature is, this little bird sitting on the top of the scaffolding, being moved across the side constantly, managed to hatch the eggs and uh, let the young ones to leave when the time uh, was right. Um, that is the inside of the university library and not the offices for the rector. Um, looking into the atrium, the outside, cladding, protection against the sun, the restaurant, which, and the inside of uh, the space um, before it was tested for uh, the right kind of acoustics. I mean, we had, it was built for European money, and we were so tight of money. But the team working on it, including the contractor, it was one of the best collaborations which I have ever experienced. And mm, that is the graphics design interpreting the difference between men and women on the loose. Well, I think that men did not want to be... Um, uh, parohace, I say it in Czech because it's cold, it's, it's the English expression which I don't know how many people know. And now the women thought that that was a goat, but it was actually a Dane. And when it was published, so somebody sent us these pictures and sent us whether we were actually in, uh, um, impressed and, uh, and influenced by the building, which is the silo in a little village outside Slane. Well, the genius who did the roof of this structure, I think it really does deserve the prize because it took us ages and he just had it straight away. Yes, uh, another building when we had to respect the urban uh, character of, of Slin. And uh, because it's the building for the students, so we just wanted to give it a little bit of joy by making, bringing the colors in. So when you look down into this very small atrium, so you can, it is like 
lift, being lifted up in the aeroplane and seeing the spring nature going from green to yellow and, and beige. And now the little roof of um, uh, the lecture theater building, which God knows when it's ever going to be built at the end of uh, Revolution Street now, which uh, replaces uh, the building which is there now. And now I think that after all this work, so there are some windows which, um, which were permitted into the party wall and the person living behind those windows, I think that is constantly complaining. So we probably never built <laughs> this building. <laughs> From similar reasons, this is a building on the River Thames in London, which um, uh, just uh, is too close to uh, the Greenwich, which is uh, a classical building, and you know, the historic building department just uh, did not, does not consider it sensitive enough to the existing environment. A bridge which was meant to go to Ostrava and which uh, of course did not happen because the developer who promised to build the bridge uh, changed his mind um, when the shopping center was almost finished so he saw that he could get away with um, not building or not investing into the bridge. And that is um, almost the last project. Uh, the case in New York when we uh, used purely glass. So that is the testing. Each thread is actually supported by the steel, uh, by the glass beam. So there is no metal again. And that is um, in how you work with those guys in a workshop, test it, light it experiment with um, everything we had so many kilos of steel on it to prove that it could it could actually work and that is during the construction just of happened in a few days and that is the exhibition of Tiffany Lamb's New York historic buildings historic society and that is not a glass staircase, but it's a staircase made in a corner of Somerset House in London, which uses the material called Acta. The intention, uh, there is a very famous staircase, but a very famous um, uh, classical architect. And now we were asked to put another staircase in an, another corner of the building. So it had to be something which was a bit special. And they wanted a glass staircase, but it is a historic building glass scratches and eventually it would have to be replaced. So again, uh, the idea comes from those um, um, the trees which, uh, which are uh, like parasites, you know, and they uh, kill the tree inside it and becomes very stiff structure around it. So we uh, use the principle of that by building a similar kind of structure in the middle, taking the floors up of the existing um, uh, building and putting the staircase and the individual threads are actually floating around this core which holds um, uh, and which takes the weight down to, um, uh, to the foundation of the building. Um, that is what you see when you look through the structure down. And that is the production. It was made in Italy. This woman is running a factory who uh, she, uh, she inherited the factory after her father who was doing tombstones in Italian marble. She decided that she was going to do something a little bit more modern. So she started working with this new material which you actually, that is the landing being taken out of the form. It is um, cast into a steel mold. And one of our recent projects, 
which is a 22-story building in Ostrava, which is 1917. It was actually built after I left. And the building, I think it is a haunted house because uh, it was... The structure is very solid, but the cladding was not up to the standard, so people had to move out. Initially, it was built as flats, and it is a sick building. And the city of uh, Ostrava decided that instead of pulling the building down and causing a lot of carbon emission and also costing a lot of money, that they would try to reconstruct the building. So that is our very um, recent project, which we are still working on. So we used the concrete structure, but turned it into a green building by giving all the apartments big balconies, which are provided by uh, hydroponic plants, and the city is going to maintain it, so because people probably would not. So as you can see, the structure is just of softened up on the edges by adding these green areas, another escape um, staircase. Looking at it. And another housing project in Prague. Another housing project, which is still on so-called drawing board. Again, I mean, we are, as you can see, all these projects are really exploring the possibility of giving people an external space which they could use the greenery and which they could improve the living environment. Here we are trying to, and because the building, if you approach the building from the corner, so we are trying to twist uh, a little bit sculpturally the balcony so we don't overshadow one by the others. Um, turning um, one of the rooms in the, in, um, uh, the, uh, the castle of Pardubice into a music room, which I think I'm talking about, you know, doing models and experiments. So the author of this little model <laughs> which you can see on the screen. Little man actually works that way. It's just of being explored. What it is that we have got a building which burned, the ceiling burned down, so we can actually replace the ceiling and move it into the existing loft. And that is um, probably the acoustic solution which would make it possible, and we produce two versions, one of them probably in timber, one of them in plaster. And that is um, the one which was chosen, is the one which I've just chosen, another music hall, this time with Friedek Mistek. Reception in Bratislava. And the last project, is um, set in, we won the competition to replace the building, which is, um, as you and Zizhkov, you know, which you probably all know, uh, between uh, Olshansk, Zhbitovy, uh, and uh, the train station. And now, I'm only showing you a tiny little bit of... Um, um, the sketches and the work which went through um, the projects, the entire office working and trying to, to see how we could shape those towers and also studying the proportion in the city and proportion. You know, this is when you look at Ludmilla Church and when you put the side on the top of it and when you put, you know, the church inside the profile of our building. So, because that is what is really so, so terribly important in architecture to understand the scale. Of course, computers have got no scale. So, in order to be able to explain to the client, to imagine how big the buildings are, so we are always trying to find some examples how you could, very, everybody knows um, the church of um, Rudmila, so everybody can imagine what is uh, the size of those little monsters. They are the same bit, of course, and they are slightly taller. 
And the intention was to provide a public space. So because if you go higher, it was not that we just wanted to, it was not an ego trip. It was really trying at this part of Prague to produce a public space, which would be used by this massive amount of development with all those private gardens, which I have to say to, you know, that in, in London, uh, we are not allowed to build those public gardens anymore. They are very comfortable, but on the other hand, not everybody has got the garden. So in order to make those spaces all public, so no new development is actually allowed to have private garden any, <clears throat> any longer. Also, we are limited in, in the amount of cars which people can have proportionally to number of flats. I mean, unfortunately, in this part of the world, the cars are still really running the show. And I think they probably will be for a very long time, even if the public means of transport in Prague are so much better and functioning so much better than they do in major European cities, I would have thought. And now, that is how the, I mean, again, we worked on this project with Overup, going back to Bright Marina, so not the same guys, because those retired, replaced by the new ones. <laughs> but no, that is really the study where the structure is uh, uh, working harder, uh, how we could add those balconies, what are different type of construction methods, how you could actually add this, the era to the basic construction cylinder, studying the effect of the wind on different shapes of the building. Um, uh, there are some public facilities like that is a maternity school. Um, and that is uh, what I mean, these are the buildings which were much, uh, much taller than we, because we were only initially allowed to do the same height as the existing building. We tried to stretch it a little bit, but of course. Um, and then we started playing as a joke for Royal Academy in London. So we just have made those little extrusions, putting in different cities in different colors, um, which was immediately bought by somebody who teaches architecture in Sorbonne. I've never met him, but I don't know why he bought it. And that is really the end, because I'm over my limit. Uh, what am I going to, to say at the end of it? I was asked now to write what are the most important aspects of designing. And now I came out with those five uh, words. One of them is inspiration, because you first of all have to have the inspiration which brings you somewhere where your dream might be. Then you have to imagine what you can do with that inspiration. Then you have to be able to interpret it. And then there is one thing that is more experience you gain, more practice you have, more understanding you, more um, tolerance uh, you achieve working with your friends because architecture is a teamwork. Everything what I've shown you is not my work, but it's a work of a huge amount of people in the office, outside the office, and uh, all the process of getting the approvals. So architecture is really not a job for a single person. Yeah, architect is supposed to hold a string and he should do, in, and that might actually last for a while, but no, the work is the work of team. There is no way as one individual can actually, you know, really hold the key to everything what happens at the end. And that instinct is something which we all have. We are constantly trying to kill it, but one has to learn the same way how we have to understand the nature, because now I just thought because I ran out of time. But you know, when I look at those 60 years of my practice, 
uh, my, I mean, my personal practice, I don't mean what I have done, I mean just of, of what I have been through. Everything has changed. The materials have changed. The system of work with people has changed. Uh, the way how we design has changed. The way how we look at our responsibilities as architects change. You know, I mean, all these things, green issues, ecology, everything, what we are now really occupying our mind with, it's a completely new aspect of how the architecture, how everything, how the environment is going to change, how life are going to change. We are not going to be surrounded by uh, luxury and no, we are not going to own millions of things and I think that hoping that we won't be driving five cars per family or even more um, but we are actually going to be very careful with what we use, what we spend, what we invest the money in and what we really need for a living. I mean, the luxury and money, and as you could see, we have done lots of um, jobs for people who really wasted money on pure luxury. It is not going, I think, to be the future which we are going to face. We have learned from it how to use the materials, but I think at the moment we are working on one hospital, which is actually you know real project in Pilsen, and we are work, we did some work on maternity hospital, hospital, which was a real joy because I think that now it doesn't happen very often that you have a chance to do something for um, other human beings and just of for people who need help and not spending money. We have been working with lots of developers at the moment, and it is very sad that you know, the housing, which I think it initially, and even when I show you this first big block of Erno Goldfinger when I was saying that he took me up the tower, you know, those architects from the period of modernism, they were actually interested, you know, he was interested in what the kitchen should look like, how people use the kitchen, how they, and he was constantly doing the sketches, how the circulation inside the home, he lived in that building himself for three months to, exp to experience what it was like living in his own building. And now I think that it's a question of money. So when I look at some of those apartments which are being built and, you know, we have done quite a few of them when you have rooms which, I, which are boxes, they are not really for living. It is just on that we are in a situation that people can't afford more. So maybe that you know, it is your job just to, to continue to fight that we have got, and we work more with heart and hum humanitarian uh, purposes and that we understand how the nature works because the nature has solved the ecology and uh, the nature can sort uh, the carbon emission and uh, carbon footprint. If we only look at the history, I was just of saying before, I'm just of reading uh, uh, Bill Branson book, uh, a little bit uh, history of a little bit of everything, of, and he is just of describing how before the man occupied the planet, how the planet actually was helping itself to get rid of the carbon by turning it into coal mines and now deposit of coal, not not coal mines and how the other part of uh, the sea creatures develop their shells which absorb the carbon combined with calcium and drop it at the bottom of the sea. So if we actually invest money in those people who understand the nature scientists rather than just of building endlessly um, without any proper research, you know, so I mean, fascinating story is the vaccination of COVID. When people can, you know, so something which was meant to take ages, so suddenly happened like that, when because there are people who are clever enough, you know, to solve those problems. But uh, I think that we all 
just of have to somehow force the people who are in power uh, to listen to those who know and support them and invest money into the solution because the fact that lots of us start putting, I mean, England is now full of insulation that people are putting cellotape around their windows and trying to insulate the windows that is not going to solve the future of the planet. But uh, there are lots of people who could if they are properly supported. And I'm going to finish with, a, with what I always finish with, um, which is um, how we do it. Somebody on the internet yesterday asked the questions how we should do it. So I made this little sketch a long time ago. And when there was a Queen's anniversary, so Royal Academicians were asked to make a drawing, you know, for the Queen, which all went into a portfolio. So this drawing was selected to go into that portfolio. I don't know whether the Queen ever looked at it. <laughs> Probably not. But no, this is when you now I try to stop and use the pointer. You start when it says it starts, you go up and down through dead ends, left and right, mess ups, and you don't know what you are doing. And then you go left and right, back, you get lost, even more lost. You go to the left, you don't find anything in the left, so you turn to the right. And then you go up, make a detour in order to get back to the same point. Still up, who knows, maybes. Then you go around in circles. Then you have to introduce a little bit of, um, I start with the bottom because I can't read, talent. Modesty, very important, discipline and effort, uh, experience, understanding, courage, and huge amount of luck. And then you start working, the sweat is filling up the sea. Most of the time, you miss the target completely. Sometimes you have got a near miss. And if you are really lucky, and if you really learn from life what you should have done <laughs> when you didn't mess it up, you might once or twice have a real hit. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Eva, very much for, I would say, a historical moment because uh, I have a feeling that we are part of history now. It is very exceptional to have a guest that can talk about 50 years of practice here. Uh, I think this is the first time that this is happening here. And I remember the 1990s with a very simple sketch of this one that you elaborated better and better over the years. And now it's, it's I would say, perfect. But I remember it just handmade. I have to sketch because I'm completely useless on the computer, you know, so, but these guys <laughs> have to stand behind me even to put those pictures on the wall, so. And now, uh, we are running a little bit late, but anyway, time for a few questions. Yes, please. Hello. I came here already with this question in my mind, but you've already answered it partly, but I will ask anyway. But we are mostly students here. What would you say is the most important thing for us to learn? Because from beginning of your presentation, I saw that probably what gave you the chances that you've been granted was uh, your capability of solid work, the, you know, the humbleness of yours, and your opening, your, your, your being open to the world. Is that it, or what would you say? I 
have to re repeat the question because we're online. So the question is, we are, most of us here are students, and uh, what would you say that is the most important thing to learn? Because as I saw it, it is a work ethic, it is modesty, and the third thing was? Being open. Being open. Yeah, I think that one of the most important thing is that you have to like what you are doing, that you are able to sacrifice the time. Um, um, you, that you are not willing to give up until you find the right solution. Also, that you learn to simplify the problems, because if you Every single problem is an extreme complex. And this is what I think that I really owe to people like Jaroslav Fragner and few people who I had in the school before. And then they actually taught us, you know, what is important to simplify every single problem. You can then complicate it again, but you have to understand exactly what you are doing. And you only understand when you actually find the bones you know, so of the problem, because usually the problem is just of completely, totally overpowering. The second thing is, as you say, the, feel the responsibility of what you are doing. Because when I was young, we were actually taught that architect is a servant of people. You know, it's not, uh, not that you would be servant of uh, uh, the clients who pay you but you are responsible to the humanity, you are responsible to people who actually would be the users of the product which, uh, which you design. And what I say, you know, every day without a smile is a lost day. You have to keep your sense of humor because that is the only thing which keeps you sane. It's the hardest job and you want to do it properly. And it's one of the hardest jobs, yes, the doctors are responsible for lives. We are also responsible for lives. If we make a mistake, the building can burn, the building can fall down. You don't always understand what other people are saying. But I think that what you said at the beginning, you know, life is a journey. And during the journey, you have to learn. And you have to, nobody, you know, can do everything at the beginning. It takes a long time just of to learn the simplest thing. But now, I just of, I, I say something which I'm quoting now. A woman who used to be a designer of silver jewelry for Jensen. I heard her talking at uh, uh, the symposium in uh, uh, Australia some time ago. She was in her 70s when she made that speech. She had never, as a jewelry designer, she had never done a speech in her life. But, um, she was asked to say something about how she looked at her work. She became very famous and having come from absolutely nothing. And she said, you know, imagine that life is full of balls. And those balls I send to you, people throw, or the life throw those balls on you. You can either pick it, drop it, or catch it and pass it on to somebody else or you can change the balls. And this is, you know, something which I think is a very short summary. You have got all those opportunities and you have to learn what to do with them. Yes, of course, you know, we all mess things up, but also you only learn from your mistakes. If we don't make any mistakes, we don't learn anything, you know, so, and no. Don't be, a, don't be afraid of making mistakes. The, I mean, I called the lecture the risk, you know, so I think that Oscar Wilde is meant to have said that the greatest risk in life is not to take the risk. And you have to take the risk of every single moment, but you have to assess, you know, whether you are actually taking a risk which uh, uh, you learn from, or which could actually hurt somebody. And it is the learning process, you know, but I think that there are two things which you have to involve, head, your heart, 
and your hands, because the communication does not go through the computer, but it goes from the head to your hand, and that hand is really creative. And the last thing which I would have said is the responsibility, you know, because we, if we become servants of the developers, you know, we haven't got much chance. I said too many things. <laughs> But I think that, you know, keep laughing because if you if you stop laughing, you know, so life is not worth living. <laughs> Thank you very much. Another question. There were very many little answers, but many of them could be written down. And we'll do that later because we have uh, everything uh, registered. I remember, Eva, one time you were saying that taking risks should not be only on the part of the architect, because everything, or nearly everything that we are doing, are prototypes. And that you talk to your clients beforehand, uh, explaining to them that if they want something original, something that hasn't been built yet, they have to go into the risk with you. Is that true? It is no. It's absolutely true because it's not. You know, of course, if you take the risk, if you just of saying that you are going to. I mean, when we did the first glass staircase, I just of used the example. Uh, I could not promise the client that we were going to get the approval. I could not promise that it was not going to to work. That people were not going to afraid to walk on it. Um, I mean, everybody, the district surveyor who gave us a permission took the risk on himself. The structure engineer who had never done it and calculated before took the risk. We assessed, you know, what we were going to do. Uh, and we were absolutely eventually, this is how this little plexiglass came in that I saw it because everybody was telling me, well, if you use 19 millimeter or 25 millimeter thick glass, if it breaks, it breaks in two big pieces. It won't hurt anybody. I can't take that risk, you know, so because I think that it's too much for me. It wasn't too much for the structure engineer, but it was too much for me. So then eventually, you know, I just thought, okay, if, if we put a piece of metal, it's not translucent. But Perspex, you know, can take that role of replacing the, or holding the glass together. So we did it, and we did about, you know, we did about 47 staircases, glass staircases. It's, um, some of them were very boring, you know, so, but, no, oops, I'm sorry. But no, during the time, the technology changed so much that now we are doing it um, triple laminated glass, which is laminated toughen. So now it is safe, but without those first steps, Everybody was making a frame with an infill, but the infill could break, you know. So this little piece of plexiglass, you know, just really took us through a long period of time of, you know, pushing the manufacturers, pushing people in the planning, in the, um, the planning zone, you know, just to understand that you have got a really fragile material, but you can make it safe because you fulfill the function of translucency, which was the issue which we were after. And then you find out the glass actually could be a structural material. So now the last staircase, which I showed, the one which is only made of glass, and it is, you know, it is four meter piece of 10 centimeter wide glass, which has got a little cantilever as a part of one little piece. Can, I mean, how many years it took before we could do it? And how many people have to actually contribute to the development of the technology of glass that it makes it possible? I don't know what the next step is. I think that, you know, glass is actually ecologically, you know, material which you can always recycle. And uh, yes, it's uh, sometimes difficult to maintain, but it's aging very, uh, um, caref well, carefully, you know, it's, uh, I mean, the aging process is uh, not catastrophically ugly and bad. <laughs> we have got staircases which are 20, 25 years old in glass. They are scratched, but it's still translucent. It has got a different quality. But 
you know, Natris at the very beginning, of course, is, I don't think that it was a big risk at the beginning that it is now. I think that, you know, when we did the staircase in New York now, my goodness me, how many sleepless nights we all had and how many, you know, tests we ran before we could actually persuade ourselves that it was going to work. And then you have the greatest test and there is an opening and you say that in, in uh, the entire, like, or entire exhibition, because it was a big exhibition on the top floor of the museum, and then there could be maximum 800 people, and then 2,500 people come, and they all of them run up and down the staircase, you know, and you stand there, and you think, well, you know, what is going to happen if we made a mistake, if we were wrong? <laughs> I don't wish anybody, you know. Um, how you feel at that moment. So, but if it survives that, so it's likely to get some future, you know. But no, but you know, it, it's a process of both because since you want to do something, you actually um, press the production and people who work in the, in the technical development to start thinking your way and resolve the problem which you, from your position as an architect, cannot solve. You know, like the tough and laminated glass. Now we actually don't do it with a film, but we do it with century film, which uh, also, if, if the glass breaks, so it makes it stable, or it uh, uh, makes it still structurally uh, uh, func functioning reasonably well. So, I mean, every single day somebody invents something so to improve not only technology of glass, but every single material. And, uh, and I think that is the same with ecology, you know, so. We just don't have to keep asking those questions. And as again, going back to last word with Fragner, there is, he used to say, um, it's not difficult to find the answer, it's difficult to find the question. And leave you with that. We have two questions that were sent online. And one of them is something that you mentioned a little bit, that it is not easy to, to build uh, or to work with developers. So the question is, how do you see the problem of uh, current developer housing uh, developments, which, uh, which see apartments more as a means of investment than uh, like places that have a quality for a living? You know, I don't really know what to say. It is a question, again, of responsibility. If you are a developer, if you have the money to invest, I think that it's your responsibility to work with people who can actually produce the environment which is habitable, which is livable, which is affordable, and no. What can we do? <laughs> I, um, I mean, you. I mean, the only thing which an architect can do to have the conscious, you know. So, because if you are conscious, so you can refuse. Somebody else will do it for half money. But no, I think that if we all put the pressure, eventually, you know, maybe something will happen. It is very difficult because very few people who make a lot of money actually have got the right kind of conscious and the money spoils uh, characters, characters and I really don't know somebody else has to find the answer. So we're just fighting, we are, you know, we are really trying very hard to do our best, but we are not succeeding terribly well. We have got you know, clients and just, of, you know, lots of people just of change change things for just of kind of entertaining themselves. So it's a constant process, the planning process, you know, how to build. Sites are difficult. I mean, the building industry and especially the system we worked. And of course, I mean, the fact that development takes so long, so it has got an impact on the developers because they take the risk lose a lot of money. So then they just of take the money out of the quality of the future development. It is very complicated. I'm sure that there are lots of people who can explain it better than I can, but I think that um, you know, one has to do one's best and fight for it 
up to the point that you lose. <laughs> sometimes we lose, sometimes we win. Hopefully you will start winning, so it's up to you. <laughs> and a very short last question. What's, what's your recommendation when you get lost in your project? Should you sort of take a few steps back or on the contrary try to find a new solution or both at the same time? The first thing is that you have to admit to yourself that you made a mistake and you are not going to get anywhere. So something else has to, you know, has to happen. So I think that my experience is that you usually have to go to the beginning and see, you know, what was the process? Why did you get to this point when you failed? And then just to try to find a different way. And I think that, I mean, in this short description, what I was saying, that every single question has got no, and no, different ways of interpretation, different answers. So my father used to say, that if you want to get either to hell or to heaven, there is not one way, but many ways. So there is always a way how you can resolve the problem. Sometimes you just have to go slightly back and sometimes you really have to start from scratch, but it needs a tremendous courage, you know, to say, first of all, to yourself, to the rest of your team, we have messed up. But once you admit it, there is a solution. I can't tell you because it, it is, there is not, I don't think that there is a simple answer. Go for a simple solution. But try to simplify the problem. Try to find out, you know, what you are actually after and build it up again. And whether it goes the same way or whether you have to turn back and go 180 degrees in a different direction or 90 degrees. You know, sometimes it needs a complete change. But no, the most important thing is just to admit it and, no, and also sometimes admit it to the client and sometimes it costs money. But the worst thing is just to carry a mistake because the mistake and lies have got, well, lie has got short legs, as we say. Mistakes have got <laughs> short legs. You, you, don't, you don't get anywhere if you, don't, if you know that something has to be done, and if you don't admit it, it's just not, not going to produce the right, right end. Eva, thank you very much for everything. Thank you for coming here. We appreciate it so much. And a little flower for you from all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Look at the extraordinary shapes and colors of those <laughs> plants. Isn't it amazing? Thank you. I'm so much done talking to you. I was sure I could do it in an hour, but I couldn't. <laughs>